Philippians chapter number 2. Probably my favorite chapter in the Bible. I've probably preached from this chapter a number of times. I've preached from this passage before as well. And uh, I, I love, I love this chapter. Memorized Philippians 2 of my teen years, and it's always spoken to me in a very profound way. My dad has a saying, and I believe that he's, he's right. Um, his, his theme or his motto of his life really is, is die to self. That is the crux of Christianity. It is die to self. And, and that, that touches a lot of areas, and that's easy to say and put it on a plaque, but to actually die to self, to your attitudes, to your opinions, to your wants, to your desires, that's a little bit harder to do. And uh, that's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. But I do believe that it is the essence of Christianity and the essence of the Christ life, dying to yourself. Well, Philippians chapter 4 spells that out. It tells you what that looks like more than any other passage that I know of in the Bible. So in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now I'll stop reading there, but we'll look at the rest of the chapter tonight. But if you'll just take those four verses that we read and just meditate on that, just think about that. The essence of that is die to self. You're not that important. It's not about you. It's about somebody else is what it is, okay? That, that's, that's tough. That's tough. And, and if I were to try to summarize verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, those four, four verses, if I was to summarize those verses in one word, that word would be submission. I think that's what it's talking about, submission. Especially in verse number 2, when you read that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, when you look at that, it seems like the theme is unity. Like-minded, one accord, one mind. And that verse obviously is talking about unity, but unity is not possible without the rest of the verses. You can't have unity without verse number three and without verse number four. So, so it is unity, but, but it is unity that's possible because of submission. When he says in verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and he's going to demonstrate that in verse six, this, this next passage. Well, the mind of Christ that is demonstrated in verse six, seven, and eight is not unity. It's submission. It's humility is what it is. And so that's why I say the theme is not unity. The theme is, is submission. In verse number three, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Well, that's going to take some submission. Let each esteem other better than himself. Well, that, that's going to take some submission too. Look not every man on his own things. Oh, look every man also on the things of others. So it's more than just getting along. But in those verses, that there is, there is meekness, there is Submission, there is service, there is humility, there is giving of yourself to somebody else. And, and all of those graces promote unity, but it's more, but it's more than unity. Submission. Submission, that's the opposite of selfishness. Uh, submission, the opposite of self-defense. Uh, submission, the opposite of self-interest, self-seeking, self-anything. Self so I want to talk to you about what submission looks like. It's probably one of the great character traits that every one of us needs to cultivate in our life. A submission to Christ, obviously, but submission to one another. Ephesians 5 talks about how the wife is to submit to the husband. There's also a verse that talks about how we ought to submit to one another, to one another. Submission. In verse 1 through 4, you have a description of submission, these verses that I've read. And I'll, not go, I'll, I'll go back to them here in just a minute. But when you think about those four verses, those verses are so, they are so antithetical to culture and to humanity and how we live that you can read it, but, but, but it's almost, you, you can't grasp it. We hear it, we read it, we acknowledge it, we say, man, yeah, that's right. 
But to live on such a high plane as those verses describe, that is radical living is what it is. It, it, it is now, it, it was back then, Philippi, Philippi was the center of Greek culture and Greeks were, were, were sophisticated people. They were advanced people. These are not backward hillbillies and, and because of their advancement and their intellect, they were proud people. The great philosophers of the day uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, they, they, all, they, they were Greeks and, and, and they had the great sculptures and they had, had the architecture and, and they excelled in science and math and astronomy and, and all of the sciences. And so, so they were very proud people because of, of their accomplishments and they had every reason to be proud of themselves. So, so it is very radical thinking for Paul to write to somebody in that culture and say, Take all, put all that pride aside. Humble yourselves and prefer others above yourself. He says in verse number one, he says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Now, now here's what Paul is saying in verse number one, is, is, is he doesn't tell us first what to do, but here's what he's telling you in verse number one, is what has been done for you by God. If you and I, if you and I are going to resist serving ourselves and being selfish people and exalting others, if we are going to have a life of serving one another and living in humility and, and living in submission, then there has to be a compelling motive for that. Okay? Well, you're not going to enter into verse 2, 3, 4, and the rest of the chapter just out of the goodness of your heart. It's too radical. So there has to be a transformation and there is something supernatural created in you when you got saved that enables you to live outwardly the kind of living that he's going to talk about. Does that make sense to you? So, so he doesn't make an appeal based on our relationship to each other. Well, boy, Joe, you ought to do this because, you know, everybody around you is such a good people. That's not, that's not the appeal. The appeal is based on your relationship with Christ. He says in verse 1, he says, if there be. That's not questioning if there is. No, it, it, it's saying, if, if there be, and there are, they are, these things are in you, and since these four things are a reality to you, then this is how you should live. Now, he mentions four things, consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, bowels and mercies, and, and some commentators go to great lengths to, to make four points out of four different statements. They, they sound real similar to me. So here's what I would say. This is how Christ has treated you. The tender, loving kindness of the Lord in my life should soften my hard heart and give me a desire to demonstrate what he has demonstrated to me to somebody else. If you're going to live in verse number two, then verse number one has to be the reality of your life. So he says in verse two, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Now again, you have four statements that sound similar. One mind, uh, like-minded, same love, one accord, and, 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 and of, of, of one mind. Of one mind. It doesn't mean we all have the same hobbies or the same interests. It doesn't mean that. We, we don't all think the same thing, but we all think the same way. Okay? Um, you, you have to somehow get to where in your mind that you think of others before you think of yourself. And I'm telling you that we have so much humanism embedded in all of us, my, myself included. That's what we are. We're, 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 we're little humanists and, and we know very little of what it is to give ourselves to somebody else. So in verse number three and four, here's the really nitty gritty. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's getting down to living now. It's not telling you to be a doormat to people where they can walk on you, but, but do become a servant to others. So, so, so he's describing what submission looks like. And I could spend the rest of the evening and we could wax eloquent on that. And we could give definitions and we could trace these words and everything. But that's it. He describes it in four verses. Now he doesn't describe it anymore. Because in verse number five, 
He's going to demonstrate it. You have the description of submission. Now you have the demonstration of submission. So instead of us sitting around all night and talking about submission and walking away and knowing what it looks like, here, here's what he says. Let me show you somebody that demonstrates that submission. Now, in, in verse number 6, if you'll just cast your eyes down to verse number 6, you, you're familiar with these verses but what he does in verse number five, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now he begins this great passage, great theological passage on the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ. And you might wonder, how do those two verses fit together? All right, first of all, hey, hey, be like-minded, uh, serve one another, nothing done to strife and main glory. Now we're in this great doctrinal passage on the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ. And verse 5 is the verse that ties it together. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's just told us in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 what kind of mind that we had to have. In verse number 5, Christ had this mind. 1, 2, 3, and 4, if you want to see somebody that did that, it's Christ. Verse number 6, this is how. This is what it looked like in his life. So in verse 5, let this mind, 1, 2, 3, and 4, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and, and on. Because he says, let nothing be done through strife for vain glory. You know who, who demonstrated that? Christ. He did nothing in strife for vain glory. Lowliness of mind, that's Christ. Esteemed others better than himself, that's Christ. Look not on your own things, but on the things of others. That's Christ, that's who it is. So you, you can't separate the two passages. And when Paul speaks of the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ, that's what he's describing. Here, 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 here's something to think about. When you read verse 6, 7, and 8, and 9 in those verses, he's talking about the, the sacrifice of Christ. Christ dying on the cross, even the death of the cross, but, but he does not speak of it here in terms of salvation. It is not in terms of substitution and atonement and ransom. Here's what he's doing. And we'll see this in a minute. He is speaking about the sufferings of Christ in terms not of what it means to you and I. That's redemption. But he's speaking of it in terms of what it meant to him. Because after he describes the death of Christ, he doesn't talk about the salvation that comes out of that. There's nothing about redeeming blood. There's nothing about forgiveness of sins for it because he's presenting it as an act of obedience and an act of submission. He's presenting it as an example. Now, 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 now that doesn't mean that, that we are called to die like he died. Obviously not. But we can have the same attitude, the same submission, and the same obedience to the Father that he had. So, so Paul is not presenting, in this passage, he's not presenting the death of Christ as the means of our salvation. It is. It is. But that's not what he's presenting here. He's presenting it as the example of our humility and obedience. Then he gets to verse number 12. And I want you to look at verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling he spends verse 6 through 11 in this great passage about Christ. Then in verse 12, he changes the subject again. And in verse 12 through the rest of the chapter, there's no doctrine. But he talks about coming to them. He talks about being sick in prison. He talks about Timothy, whom they would be familiar with, came and helped. And he talks about this man named Epaphroditus. And so now it is just a very personal section. So, 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 so watch this. One, two, three, four. This is what you should be. 5 to 11, Christ demonstrated it. Verse number 12 leaves the subject entirely. Now it's all personal, something personal to the church at Philippi. But I don't think it is a change in subject. I think it's the same. I think that in verse 12 to verse number 30, he is still giving demonstrations of what verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 looks like. In Philippians chapter 2, he mentions three men by name. Christ, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. And all three men demonstrate what submission looks like. All three of them. 
Three examples. First of all, there is the example of Jesus. Now, no man, no man ever exemplified submission and humility more than Jesus Christ. Let this mind be old to be like Jesus. Old to have the mind of Christ. So what is the mind of Christ? Do you remember Lucifer? Do you remember Isaiah 14, Lucifer? Here, here's his mind. He says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of, of the congregation in the sides of the Lord. I, I will, I will, I will. Here's the mind of Christ. Not my will, but thine be done. That's his, that's his mind. Now, quickly, I, I want you to look at verse 6. Just, let's just run through these verses quickly and it's a, it's a beautiful passage, and I, I hope that you're, you're, you're attentive and you're, you're awake to it because it, it's, a, it's a beautiful passage. But in verse number 6, here's the son who was the sovereign, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now break it down. Who, being in the form of God, form, that's an outward appearance that reflects an inward nature. It's, it's another way of saying that, that his, his, his essence is his, his sensual being. He possesses the very being and the very nature of God. In verse number seven, made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant. There's that word again, form of a servant. He didn't just look like a servant. He was a servant. So in verse number six, who being in the form, okay, didn't just look like God. He was God, is God. Thought it not robbery, to be equal with God, to rob, is to take something that doesn't rightly belong to you. In John 5, the Jews sought to kill him even more because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said that God was his father, watch this, making himself equal with God. When he claimed to be one with the Father, he's not claiming something that didn't rightly belong to him. He's not robbing a title. No, no, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The son who was the sovereign. But then in verse number seven, you have the sovereign who became a servant, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. I love that phrase, he made himself of no reputation. That's a great statement. I think that IFB would do great to work on making themselves of no reputation. I really believe that. I know, I, I'll just get off on a little hobby horse, all right? I know a lot of people that are working really hard on their reputation. Yeah, that's what social media is for, right? It is to build my brand. It's to build my name, right? To get a reputation. Why don't you be like Jesus, made himself of no reputation. Can you imagine Jesus with a Twitter? Huh? Posting about all of his miracles. Huh? Announcing all the great revival meetings he's been preaching. Huh? Can, can you imagine that? No. He made himself of no... Hey, listen. Nobody needs to know your name. Right? Amen. I, I could preach on that, but, but I, I just think that's a great phrase. He, he doesn't say... Let the whole world go to hell, but I'm not putting my deity in the street. He doesn't say that. He doesn't refuse to be poor. He doesn't refuse to beggar himself. He doesn't refuse to become flesh. The, the poet Milton said it this way. He forsook the courts of everlasting day and chose with us a house of mortal clay. I love that. He could have said, Father, I'll go, but I'm going to retain my equality and I'm not compromising on that but he made himself of no reputation. He could have said, I'll go, but I wanted to be like Sinai. Thunders and lightnings and everybody see it. But he made himself of no reputation. He could have said, I'll go, but I want my train to fill the temple and I want the cherubims to worship me. But he made himself of no reputation. He could have said, I'll go, but I want every day to be a mount of transfiguration with glory shining on my face, and, and I, want, I want to be seen coming in clouds of glory, but he made himself of no reputation. 
came, came into the darkness and he pitched his tent where blasphemers live and he came to be blasphemed by his brethren and tempted by the devil and he came in no beauty and no glory and he became a man who was despised and rejected and somebody ought to rejoice that he made himself of no reputation. Then it says he took upon him the form of a servant. Would it not be enough? Would it not be enough to just to not retain your glory as the second person of the Godhead, but to lower yourself to that? If you're not going to come as Almighty God, then, then what form would you choose? What, what role would you choose? Well, what if he was to come? What if he's to come fully human, but come as an emperor of a vast domain. He'd still come, couldn't he? Well, what if he was to come? I mean, God, God becoming man, but come as a, as a silver-tongued orator that would command the masses with his word. But why don't you come like that? I mean, if you're going to come, if, 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 if God is going to become man, then, then why not come as an iron-fisted dictator who rules the world by by force and brutality. No, he came in the form of a servant. He was as much a servant on earth as he was God in heaven. He didn't just play God. He was God. He didn't just play a servant. He was a servant. No possessions and no privileges and no position and, and no, no advantages. And to his vast resume, he now adds servant. <laughs> that amazes me took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Possessed all the attributes of deity. Now he possesses all the attributes of humanity. His humanity is not a phantom manhood. He didn't come in just the appearance of humanity. It's not just a temporary role that he played in the Old Testament. There's a Christophany in it. And he took on an appearance for, 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 for a, 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 a limited amount of time, a pre-incarnate appearance. And, and he would take on the form of a man or take on the form of an angel, but he didn't become that. It was just taking on the form. But now, now he has become man. Nothing Human was alien to him. All of his human was found in him. Veiled in flesh to God had see. Held the incarnate deity. Being found in fashion in verse 8. Being found in fashion as a man. He was made a man and was found to be a man. This is how the world viewed him. They saw him as a man. There's a whole lot more to see. They didn't recognize. They recognized his humanity, but they didn't recognize his divinity. He's the God man. They didn't see the God part. Made himself, took himself with no reputation, took upon him the form of servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. The sovereign became a servant. But then in verse number 8, the servant became the sacrifice. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Every man has a limit to how far he will go. Every man has a limit to how far you can push him. So he finally says, that's far enough. Many of men will go the second mile. And many of men will go the third mile. But somewhere he's going to say, I'm not going any farther. I, I've, I've, I've done all that I can do for you. But look how far Jesus went. Somewhere in the sorrows of grief, you would think he would say, that's enough. That's far enough. Somewhere in the denial of his brethren and the blasphemy of Jewish elders, the accusing of him working by the power of Beelzebub, slandering his name and lying about his detentions and mocking his claims. Somewhere in all of that, you would think he would say, Father, that's far enough. Somewhere in the agony of Gethsemane and the betrayal of Judas and the abandonment of his disciples and the kangaroo court of the Sanhedrin, somewhere in all of that, you would think he would say, Father, that's far enough. <laughs> I mean, somewhere, somewhere in the cries of crucify him, 
somewhere in the humiliation of standing before Caiaphas and Herod and Pilate, and somewhere in the accusations and the crown on his thorns and the scourging on his back and the, and the broken reed and smiling his face and plucking his beard out and mocking him as the king of the Jews, somewhere in all of that you would think you would say, I've done enough. But he became obedient unto death. Watch this. Even. Even the death of the cross. Not just death, but that death. Excruciating, embarrassing, degrading, humiliating, painful, cruel death that is reserved for the scum of the earth. That's reserved for the very worst of society. See that man on the cross? That's the God of the universe. <laughs> All the way. You and I wouldn't have done it that way. No, no. I would have sent him to a palace. If I was the father, I'd have had him born in privilege and prestige. And I'd have made sure that the whole world loved him and revered him and dare anybody to slander him. And I'd have, I'd have, I'd have burnt them up with fire. I mean, I'd have done it differently. But this is how God saves sinners. This is what God thinks of you. That the sovereign will become a servant. That the servant will become a sacrifice. In verse 9, 10, and 11, the sacrifice becomes the sovereign again. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Given him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now remember the point of the passage. Christ is our example. It is telling you that this is what submission looks like. Submit yourself, humble yourself as Christ humbled Himself. However, humility and submission is not the end game. Submission and lowliness with God is not the end game. It wasn't for Christ and it's not for us. Humility is the gateway to exaltation. Whomever God humbles, he will exalt. You know who said that? Jesus said that. Matthew 23 and verse 12, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that shall humble himself also shall be exalted. James 4 and verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. In God's economy, you get by giving. You live by dying. You find your life by losing it. You are exalted by humbling yourselves. So verse number 5 through 8 is telling you what humility looks like. Verse 9, 10, and 11 tells you what exaltation looks like looks like, and we don't have time to go through these verses, but whoever God, whoever humbles himself, God, God exalts. And this is our example. As Christ humbled himself, you and I should humble ourselves just as God exalted him. God will exalt us. So can you see how that little survey through those verses, can you see how that Christ is the example of the ideal of verse 1 can you see that? Can you see how that Christ exemplified the loneliness of mind, the esteeming others better than themselves, the humility, the servanthood, the submission? This is a picture of what that attitude looks like. Look at verse number 19. Here's the second example, and it's Timothy. Look at verse number 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you. But I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Now, just a personal note to the church at Philippi. 
and he's commending Timothy to them, and he hopes to send Timothy on ahead of himself. Timothy was with Paul the first time that Paul visited Philippi so they would know him. However, Timothy had just come on board with Paul and Silas when they went to Philippi. So he's young, he's green, he's inexperienced. Youth is what he is. And when they thought of Timothy, they probably thought of a, of a kid, a young man, and, and he has no experience in the ministry, but Paul is commending him in the ministry, and, and, and Timothy becomes Paul's closest companion. I think mentions him 24 or 25 times in all of his epistles. So in verse 22, he talks about how that he is, he is my son. He says, he says he's a dearly beloved son. Dearly beloved son. He is, um, he, he, he's, he's, he, he's Timothy's mentor is what he is. He has taken him under his wing as a father would take a son. In verse 20, in verse 20 he, he's his servant. I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He has a servant's heart. He has a concern for other people and their needs. He has a mind to serve others. In verse 21, he is, he is the apostle's substitute. All seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Verse 23, him therefore I hope to send presently as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. I, I, I'm in Rome and I'm in house arrest and I, I'd like to send him as an ambassador of me to the church at Philippi. I can't go myself, so I'd like to send him in my stead. By the way, there was a great number of believers in the church of Rome. He mentions 26 of them by name in Romans chapter 16. But of all of them, but of all of them, the one that will go, the one that I can trust, the one that won't be bothered, be put out, is Timothy. It's just a personal note, but, but what he's doing is he's saying that Timothy has the same attitude that I'm imploring you to have in verse 1, 2, and 3, and 4. He, he has a servant's heart. He puts my needs over his own. He's not trying to compete with me. He's not trying to get a position as an apostle. Here's a man who works in the shadows. He, took a great, he took, takes a back seat to the apostles. He, he wrote no epistles, but what a Christ-like man. He's giving you an example. But then there's a third example that's Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion and laborer and fellow soldier, but your messengers and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Epaphroditus was a believer in the church at Philippi. He, had, he was the guy that came to Rome to visit Paul and brought the offering that the church at Philippi had brought. And Paul mentions that in chapter number 4. He's also the guy who will deliver this letter back to the church at Philippi. He will also deliver the letter to Colossians and Ephesians. This is Epaphroditus. In verse number 25, just very quickly, he says he's a balanced believer. He said, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, companion and laborer, and fellow soldier, but your messenger. I get the idea this man will do whatever he's needed to do. But whatever you ask him to do, He's available. But he also was a burdened believer. Look at verse 26. It's very interesting. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because as you'd heard that he'd been sick for indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. Not, him only on, not on him only but on me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Very sick man. And God had mercy on him healed him. Spared his life. But he was very sick. And in verse number 26, he was full of heaviness, sorrow because of his sickness. That's not what it says. Now look at verse 26. Stay with me. Okay? For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. He didn't want you to know about it. <laughs> Huh? He tried to keep it from you. But when he found out, you found out that he was sick and that you were worried about him. That's what gave him heaviness. Yeah. I'm talking about, do you understand I'm talking about this, this, this humility, this submission? It ain't about you. I'm not the one that's important. I'll help you tonight. 
I'll help somebody. You don't have to announce every tummy ache on Facebook. Okay. Every, I, I'm not, I'm, listen, I, and we got some sick people in our church. Okay. You know, I'm just, but you don't have, every ingrown toenail is not a prayer request. Are we, are we okay tonight? Are we okay? Because I think this is really good. I think this is very important. Some of you will die before anybody knows you're sick. Because you just ain't telling nobody. And by the way, that's not good. You should tell me. Okay? You go in the hospital, I should know. Okay? And some of y'all have been in the hospital and got out, and I had no idea that you were there. Yeah? And, and some of you, you will die before you know any, before anybody, you ask my dad how he's doing. Doing good, doing good, doing great. Yeah, emergency room last night, but doing good, doing good, great, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll die before he tells you anything's wrong with him. And some of you hope you can, you hope you do get sick so you can announce it. He was a burden believer. Verse 28, he's a blessed believer. The word Epaphroditus means charming. What a charming Christian. He was a blessing to everybody that came in contact with him. And what a tragedy to go through life and not be a blessing to others. Now, I'm watching the time. You don't have to. Quick summary, three many names. Christ, Timothy, Epaphroditus. And I believe that all three of them give you a demonstration of what he is telling us to be in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you can read verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we can parse every statement and what consolation and comfort, and we can do a study of bowels and verses and everything. Or you can find somebody that exemplifies it in their life, and that's what he does. And he says, I'm not going to go into this long theological discourse on the difference between consolation in Christ and comfort of love, and I, I may not be able to tell you the difference between like-minded and being of one accord, but here's what it looks like in somebody's life. This is what submission to one another. This is what humility this is what dying to self, this is what it looks like. That brings me to the dynamics of submission. Let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just put it in our lap and let's live it for just a minute, okay? What, what are the dynamics? What, 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 what is it? How, how do you know when you are living, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4? Well, number one, when you are willing to be sent anywhere. Of all of the places that Christ came, he came here. A planet that was nothing but a speck of dust in the universe. There are a billion planets he could have went to, but he came here. Of all of the creatures to choose to save, he chose to save us. When Paul informed Timothy that I want you to go to Philippi, it is 500 miles away. And he doesn't argue, and he doesn't protest. He simply goes. And Epaphroditus is sick. The man is sick unto death. And Paul says, I need you to take this letter back to the church of Philippi. And if submissive spirit is revealed in the idea, I will go, I am needed. Where do you need me? Willing to be sent anywhere. Secondly, willing to serve anyone. Christ came not to be meant to minister, to be ministered to, but to minister. He took upon himself the form of a servant. Timothy is not jockeying for a leadership role. Timothy is not thinking, thinking you know, all the apostles are dying off, and when they're dead, somebody's going to step in their place, and I'm going to, I'm going to position. He's not trying to do that. No, he says in verse number twenty-two, he hath served with me. Paul said of Epaphroditus that he hath ministered to my wants. You better be careful mentioning something you want around Epaphroditus. He's going to go get it. Not my needs. He ministered to my wants. He is going to go get it for you when you are willing to serve anyone. And here's the third thing. When you're willing to sacrifice anything. Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I get the idea, no sacrifice was too great. Paul said of Timothy later 
that he counted not his life dear unto himself. And it sounds like Paul is a little bit frustrated because he says in verse 21, he said, all seek their own. But thank God for one man who regarded not even his own life. Epaphroditus in verse 30, he regarded not his life. That's the mentality, by the way, of chapter 1 and verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So you read Philippians 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Here's what you could do with it. It makes a beautiful plaque. If you can take these words and print them out in calligraphy and put some little grapevines down the side, side and put it in a frame and hang it on a wall, it's beautiful art. But it's more beautiful when it's in your life and when it's in mine. And it's radical living. And I read it and I say, yeah, I know it's true. I know it's right. I know it's expected of me. It sure is hard on the flesh. But that's the Christ life. And can I tell you that if you would capture verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 in your life, can I tell you that it will help you in your anger? Can I tell you it will cure you of your hatefulness? Can I tell you that you won't be as harsh to people? It'll help you in your marriage. It'll help you on your job. It'll help you with sibling rivalry. It'll help you in the church. And you and I need to say, I need that spirit in my life. And Paul says, let me show you three men who lived it. The submissive spirit. It begins, it begins tonight. Jacob, get ready to sing. It begins with the transforming power of Christ in you. It begins with knowing Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And we talk about the change that salvation brings, and it does. You quit smoking and dipping and chewing and cursing and all of that stuff, but he also works an inward change. You know what Christ can do? He can calm the temper. You know what Christ can do? He can squash the angry spirit. You know what Christ can do in your life? He can cleanse that bitter, envious, clamoring spirit. That's what Christ can do. And this kind of living comes through the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing less than the Christ life, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Don't you want that in your life today? Don't you want to add your name to the list of Philippians chapter 2 of men and women who demonstrate that? and then